In 2006, we lost Ronnie Sox of the famous Sox and Martin racing team. It was a shock to the Mopar world, and we all realized at that moment that we were not going to have our heroes around forever. Soon wrote an editorial in Mopar Collector's Guide referencing how we needed to do a Hall of Fame for the Mopar heroes that we grew up with to preserve Mopar history for the future generations. As the years went by, I ran into a good friend of mine, Jim Kramer, at a show, and he asked me when I was going to do a Mopar Hall of Fame. I must have looked at him with a yeah right look in my eyes. He proceeded to say, if you don't do it, no one else will. In my heart of hearts, I knew he was right, so in 2011, I began lining up sponsors and critical people to help me pull something together that the entire Mopar community could be proud of. What we ended up with was a number of Hall of Fame induction dinners that were held Saturday night of each Chrysler's at Carlisle event from 2012 until 2018. The Mopar Hall of Fame will go forward each preceding year in the pages of Mopar Collector's Guide magazine. This is one of those recordings made on one of those incredible nights at the Mopar Hall of Fame at Chrysler's at Carlisle. In multiple warehouses. Mopar, wanted, Mopar people wanted parts developed by Mopar engineers. And we have the backbone of the Direct Connection group here with us tonight. The late Brian Stram started this program. Charlie Henry couldn't be here tonight. He's recovering from a liver transplant. Larry Henry started an auto parts store at 19 in Flagstaff, Arizona. He was a true Mopar guy. He moved to California to take a position with Dodge Truck. From there on to Keith Black, where he put a Mopar performance high performance program together, he met Brian Stram and moved to Detroit. From there, they put together the Direct Connection Warehouse and Catalogs. When someone asked him what he did at Chrysler, and I think this is perfect, he would respond happily with, I get paid to do what I would pay to do. There were a lot of us involved in this program that felt the same way. That was a great quote, Larry. I love that. Warren T. Hart was hired in the suspension lab at Chrysler. He worked on the Superstock Spring program, which we all ran, and they worked fantastic. He went on to NASCAR, eventually ran the Chrysler Woodard Garage. From there, he ran the Superstock Clinic program, which included the major teams of Sox and Martin, Dick Landy, and Grunt Grother. Played a huge part in the Direct Connection program, setting up dealers and warehouses across the country. He helped me get my Direct Connection warehouse program with Chrysler. Larry Shepard, better known as Shep, was involved in all aspects of the Direct Connection. He put together the race bulletins that were given to the Mopar racers. These bullets would lay out what bills they would follow in order to go fast. He was the author of one of the most well-known Mopar books out there referred to as the Chrysler Bible. I have his books around my garage and use them as a reference all the time. Dan Lewandowski, <clears throat> he answered the order line and dealt with all the warehouses. He was incredible knowledgeable with the Mopar parts program. The downside of his position was that people would take their back order frustrations out on him me included. It may be hard to believe. I've spoken to Dan probably a thousand times on the phone in my life and never met him until today. And I was finally able to put a face with a name after 30 years, and it was a pleasure to meet him. With this group of misfits, someone had to keep everything together. Kathy Liberia, and if I pronounce that wrong, I apologize, was a mastermind who worked behind the scenes to keep everything moving. If you needed something done, she was the lady who would make it happen. Now, if y'all could all come up here and accept the Hall of Fame induction for Direct Connection. Hi. I hope, well, let me move this thing a little bit. Hopefully everybody can hear me. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Larry Shepard, <clears throat> and it's a real honor for me to represent Direct Connection and these wonderful people here on the stage with me. <clears throat> there, as uh, Herb mentioned, uh, Charlie Henry could not make it tonight, 
Um, and <clears throat> in his honor, uh, Mr. Pete Gladys, who is over here and going to do the Viper thing, happened to bring up a, an item that I did not put in my speech and is not in any of my slides. <clears throat> but in the early 1980s, we decided to go road racing with four cylinders, 2.2 engines and all this excitement. <clears throat> Charlie was one of our SCCA road racing drivers. This led to Charlie going road racing with Team Shelby. Team Shelby was run by Mr. Pete Gladys, who was over here representing Viper. After, team, after the Team Shelby program, he went Vipering. <clears throat> He's going to talk on that. But anyway, a little uh, hello out to Charlie for all of that. <clears throat> this evening, we are missing Mr. Schramm, who passed on. He was our boss for most of the period of time. And as I go through my slides, I will probably mention that more than <clears throat> the world needs to know. Um, we had two early members that are not here this evening, Bill Soss and Nesta Cosmo. And we had two members that were short-term members in John Crawford, who you'll see in a photo up here, and uh, Tom Cunningham. <clears throat> that is our team. We work closely together. I love them. Good to them. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Mopar Collectors Guide for putting on the event. I'd like to, you know, Robert Wolf in particular, um, I'd like to, to give a special thanks to Tim Costello, who's sitting over here, and he actually made the presentations you're looking at this evening. Uh, um, and uh, the event, I'm not exactly sure how to put it, of the Hall of Fame, uh, Lisa Leatherly. And, uh, um, all the other honorees this evening, um, it is an honor to be up here with you. Uh, the Chryslers of Carlisle for putting on the event out at the racetrack, all the attendees here this evening. Uh, but I'd like to make one little comment. <laughs> when Mr. Workman was up at the beginning, he mentioned about the, the uh, Hemis and the block castings and the fact that one block that won the race was cast on the 10th and made the race on the 22nd. <clears throat> Mr. Schramm loaded that, not that engine, but four or five of them into his truck and drove them down personally to that race. That was Mr. Schramm. One of the many things that we got to do way before my time. <laughs> so anyway, to get into the presentation, uh, I used to do the, the clinic program. Hopefully most of you well, maybe some of you know, <laughs> I gave it up a few years back. <clears throat> well, I used to do that. It was Mr. Hoover's idea originally. And Mr. Hoover used to travel with me, and he would <clears throat> was be the main speaker. And Mr. Hoover, and I, don't, I cannot imitate, imitate Mr. Hoover's voice. I won't try to do it. But Mr. Hoover's opening line for every seminar that we had was, <clears throat> Good morning. I bring you good news from the factory. <clears throat> well, I've been retired for 15 years. Most of the rest of us have been for some number. We won't bother to get into it. Uh, so I guess today we would just say, we as retirees welcome you here. <clears throat> With that, we'll get into the, oh, how did that get up there? <laughs> um, anyway, you can't sell parts unless you've got cars to put them on. These were little handouts that were given out to the Max Wedge, which is on the far side, the 426 Hemi, which in 1965 or four. Um, these were really uh, specification sheets, kind of little things to tell you what you just purchased, you know, what the specifications were, how to set it up. This is very important because it comes down to tune-up tips, which helps tie the parts to how to make them go fast. Uh, oh. How about that? <clears throat> These were followed up pretty much at the same time with technical service bulletins and other um, technical information. And what Mr. Hu was generally trying to do is to help our ratios go fast with their new Hemi or the Max Wedge, which is pretty much the same uh, idea. <clears throat> Whoops, oh, I went too fast. Okay, the, <clears throat> the one at the top is a typewritten 
That's the, the first catalog. All that actually is probably the second one. Mr. Schramm always said his first catalog only had two pages. That one there has three. <laughs> so I think that was the second catalog. <clears throat> the one on the left was the first one that they bound. And you'll notice that it says uh, drag racing parts or Chrysler performance parts, which is what they called it in those days. Uh, they were there to provide uh, high performance parts to the guys that bought those cars. Max Wedges, 440 Hemi, uh, 440 hadn't come out yet, 426 Hemis, uh, which were pretty much the main uh, performance cars at that time. And then the, the green one over here is the next one after that. <clears throat> this leads up to the Hustle Stuff program, which was done originally about 1967. That's the one on the far left. The 69 is over here. This program folded in with the Chrysler performance parts. This was done by Mopar, not Chrysler. And I said, well, it's all the same thing. But theirs was street program. The Chrysler performance parts was really a racing program. Oops, oh, did it again. Sorry for my clumsiness on the, whoops. <coughs> Now, in about 1967, Chrysler came out with the, the clinic program. The other two books were the first two. These were the four clinics. That, by the 1970, we had four. Started out with Sox and Martin and Landy, Dodge, Plymouth, um, and became these four. The, these books basically were tune-up books. Um, I don't know how many of the sponsors were also players in this, but I know the Hearst people were. Uh, Edelbrock, uh, there's some header, hooker headers, uh, but they all were players in, as part of this presentation. These were probably about 10 or 12 page booklets. They basically tried to tell you how to go fast. <clears throat> uh, this is the first cover we got, I don't know, it's probably not the very first one, <clears throat> but I always liked this. That's Mr. Hoover on the back, on the back end of the car, uh, Mr. Spear or somewhere out there. <laughs> Uh, who is the one on the right? I always like this because I think this is perhaps the most famous big picture of Chrysler in, in race. Uh, four or five of them are the uh, guys that built the car. Then we have, whoa, who we? Uh, let's see, where's the, no, it don't work. The gentleman on the high right is Tom Coddington. Al Adam is down in the center. Tom Hoover is over on the far left. John Bauman is on the lower left. He passed away a few years later. Uh, those are all Chrysler employees. The Donnie Carlton is the second one in on the right-hand side. He's the driver. And then Spihar's guys that built the car across the back. This is the missile. <clears throat> anyway, I, I like that. There's a reason I do this, because there's another picture that looks kind of something like this that nobody really ever sees. Come on. There we go. Book on the far right. This, this one over here on this side with the missile on it was still a direct connection. It's not a direct connection. It's performance parts catalog. Over there, you'll notice that it says SP1, Special Parts 1. That's the first direct connection catalog. You'll notice it does not say direct connection on it. If you, I don't know if you can read it. It says January 1st, 1973. The decision was made, this has to go to SEMA. <coughs> yeah, SEMA was uh, the very first week of November. That decision, they had to print the catalog so we could get it to, to the SEMA show. The direct connection decision was made in February. The decision to print the catalog was made in September. No direct connection. But that is the first one. Uh-oh. How'd that get in? Any, oh, I know it, huh? <laughs> You will notice it says WD proposition. <clears throat> this actually is the WD half of the direct connection program. The far picture is Mr. Schramm is kind of back too. And the number one dealer, Ray Angelelli, is accepting. <clears throat> and that is the handsome Larry Henry on the extreme right. <laughs> this is Larry Henry right here. <laughs> same guy. <clears throat> I look yeah. same. You'll notice the guy in the upper right, Herb McCandless. <laughs> okay, and then Ed Hamburger and Joe Amato, I believe. No, these are the first four 
WDs, warehouse distributors, for the direction action. And one of the unique aspects of the direction action program, which we wanted to do, was we wanted it to be a dealer, which is corporate dealers, and warehouse distributor program. The GM program only went to dealers. The Ford program at that time only went to WDs. We wanted to do both. It ain't easy. <clears throat> this is the first three catalogs, SP5, 6, 7. You'll notice <laughs> the uh, somewhat strong emphasis of racing. <clears throat> the, uh, for the most part, the racing dominated the parts that we sell, even though the Hustle Stuff program came in, was really a street program, but it took us a little while to get some of the street aspects changed from the way the Hustle Stuff people did them. Um, but anyway, th these are the first three of the catalogs. Now, the photo that no one really knows about, <laughs> The handsome young man at the top is our own Larry Henry. This picture was taken from the top of Mr. Schramm's office. I believe Kathy was sitting below that <laughs> in her office. <clears throat> that is every part that it takes to make a kit car. Now you think about that. It, it could be any drag racing car, any circle track car, it doesn't make any difference. That's every piece in the engine, every piece of sheet metal, frame the whole nine yards. It's, it's quite an amazing shot. But unfortunately, not very many people ever see it. <laughs> That's the first direct connection catalog, I mean the kit car catalog on the far right. You'll notice the same picture. This is the first really printed catalog over here. They did one more that has a black background instead of a white. But those are the kit car program uh, catalogs that we did as a supplement. They were done in about 1975. 1976. Um, it was a reasonably successful program. We were trying to get into circle track racing. That's a story by itself. I don't want to get, I have to get on course here. <laughs> don't want to get off track. I'm very easily distracted by my thing. <clears throat> okay, these are my two test cars. I didn't actually have two at the same time, probably. Uh, the red one was, I did almost all my hydraulic cam testing in. Uh, the, the one at the bottom is uh, I, that's actually second hand. I got it from used from Ted Flack. <coughs> uh, we did our, some of our small block uh, engine development program in that particular car when they were done with it. <coughs> oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want to show you what we did until the next picture. But a lot of the, the newer hydraulic cams, which I'll tell you about in just a few minutes, we developed in the red car at the top. I put on more runs in a day than most people would put on in a year. Flack used to yell at me because he had to use two or three sheets of paper, and that's one line per rate, per line cycle. I just go up and down three right, and then we change. <laughs> well, anyway, neither here nor there. Okay, here we are. <laughs> this is this is my white test car. You'll notice, <clears throat> uh, if I'm not uh, guessing, the engine, the orange engine, right on the right front. That's my uh, 600 horsepower uh, 440 super gas motor that is going in that car. The first gentleman is Mr. Schramm. Whoops, I'm getting away from the mic. Second gentleman, a very handsome young man, is Dan Lewandowski. <clears throat> the tall gentleman in the back is Bob Kuzno. <clears throat> Next over is Nesta Cosmo. Danny, you knew who the last guy is? Oh, that's uh, Dave, Johnson. Dave Johnson. Last gentleman on the next to Nestor. Then the first gentleman on the uh, left-hand side at the front is Bill Sosh. The somewhat angry-looking young man there is John Crawford, <laughs> Fam famous rallyist and guy that goes to the uh, mountain of the clouds or whatever they call it in Colorado uh, and drives at high speed around the curve. That's, no, that's crazy. Anyway, that's Crawford. Next gentleman is handsome Larry Henry. I don't know who that dude is in the back. He can be anybody, I guess. Neither here nor there. A useful Larry yeah, Shepherd. useful Larry <laughs> Yeah, right. Certainly is. Okay. Whoops. Come on. There we go. Oops. Okay. We started doing, uh, as we had combined the, the uh, Hustle Stuff program together with the uh, uh, Chrysler Performance Parts, which were blocks and heads and things of this nature, we started to get into production items that uh, 
actually made life better for everybody in the world. Electronic ignition systems were developed in 1971 by the production people. We made them available to everybody. Well, we had to go back for about 15 years to f convert every car ever built to an ignition system that actually worked. Um, there's no, part, no points to adjust, none of that stuff. Great ignition system. Um, so it was, we did chrome valve covers, which basically was a production valve cover. We just deleted all the uh, brackets on it, had it chrome. The trick to that is to find somebody that can chrome the cover. Not that they don't know how to do it, it's just the emissions people came in. <laughs> These things, uh, chroming is a, a very hazardous program. So you, a lot of the companies went out of business. <clears throat> the uh, camshaft, Mr. Schramm came up with this word, purple shaft. Uh, we were doing, we had bought a lot of our cams and the hustle stuff people did from a gen nice gentleman in California named Racer Brown. SSH 25, SSH 44, uh, all of that stuff. Um, well, we wanted to do basically our own cams. So we didn't know what to call them, so Shram decided that he, he came up with, well, he, he talked to the supplier that we had. He said, can you paint them purple? Because it, purple stands out, nobody in the world had a purple camshaft. So we called them purple shafts, and I developed them in the little red car that you saw, and we had uh, basically three or four A engine, three or four B engine. That's what we were doing. All hydraulic stuff, all for the street. In 1970, 71, that actually is a, is a remake of the, the Alcoa 65 Hemi head. <clears throat> we wanted to make some more. Alcoa didn't want to make them. Mr. Schramm and Mr. Hoover and the engineering gentleman at Highland Park Engineering helped us. But that was really the first cylinder head that Mr. Schramm and, and the performance parts people, whatever we want to call us, uh, went out and made. Um, and they actually were called D4As. Right, Herb? <laughs> and the, uh, um, the D4 had been a cast iron cylinder head. And what we, it was a very good casting, but it was heavy as, <clears throat> you know what. Um, so basically, we had a guy in California called Mullen uh, that ported them, and we called them D4As. He basically put the same port into the aluminum cylinder head, and uh, that was our, kind of our first experiment with making cylinder heads. This is kind of number two. The, the W2 cylinder head that someone mentioned earlier, oval ports, big. It's probably the best small block head ever as a cast iron piece. Uh, and it made a lot of horsepower, and it, made, it did a lot of wonderful things, um, but we had to go make tooling. It obviously doesn't look like anything in production, so we owned the tooling. In 1980, when Chrysler went through the loan guarantees, and Mr. Iacocca and all, all the history that you know about that, the, someone at the scrapyard stole our tooling and scrapped it. <laughs> so when we went back to make more, I had to make all new tooling. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself because that's really direct uh, Mopar performance rather than direct connection. We were able to, as long as we were direct connection, we were able to keep that in supply. Oops, wait a minute. <clears throat> this is the stage four cylinder which is a cast iron, slightly modified V or RB head, and it is the last cast iron anything that went down the B engine assembly line at Toledo. Because when they, went, when they machined that head, they tore the machining out and threw it away, because that was in 19, August of 1978. <clears throat> the nice thing about that is I got to keep the tooling, <laughs> which becomes important a few years later when we do the stage five. Uh, now, most of the, the intake manifold stuff that we did, again, we're looking at street or strip or whatever the case may be, uh, we would go to the aftermarket people that made intake manifolds. Edelbrock, this is a Holly. Uh, there were often houses and YNs and whatever. Uh, we would take all those manifolds, bolt them on a representative vehicle, and whichever one went fastest was the one we would sell. Well, if you remember, about in this particular era, 1974 5, um, the Holly was only listed as best for the automatic transmissions. 
And I'm not going to tell you what was best for the manuals. It was an often house of Portasonic, but you had to add four popsicle sticks. So we didn't like to push that one. It's a real pain to do. Nobody tended to do it. Whoops, oh, oh back up. <clears throat> In about 1967, as an outgrowth of some of those earlier books that I showed you, this particular group of, of handouts were done by the uh, Dodge people. And, and basically, they're just performance books that try to tell you how to modify your engine. As you notice, the B engine's up, up in the upper left, the Hemi in the upper right, small block, six-cylinder. Uh, so this was really the first kind of classy attempt at, at making handouts to help the race, Chrysler races go fast. This is, oops, sorry, second generation. These were done by Plymouth. Now, if you notice, there's a somewhat of a unique artistic feel to these. The backgrounds were made by Peter Max. Uh, I don't know if you know art, and I shouldn't try to pretend that I do. I just know who Peter Max is. At this time, he's a young kid in Ohio that's becoming an artist. It's a very interesting flair. He made giant posters for us, wonderful stuff. Uh, these are handouts like the earlier ones, divided up by engine. They basically are a trifold. They open up really kind of neat things. We, we gave all this stuff away. <clears throat> this is the next generation as a response to the Plymouth ones. These were done by Dodge in about 1971. Um, and again, they're basically the same type of thing, just each time you gloss it up, try to add more information and update it for the latest uh, things that come along. This was an ad, this is a Peter Max ad. Um, there are some posters that are virtually as big as that one that he made. They're a beautiful thing. We reprinted them about, 50, oh no, I retired then, somewhere in the mid-1980s, I believe, and they were reprinted off my own personal posters. Come on, there we go. <clears throat> when I came into the race group, I had a two million mag, uh, letters. I, I started sorting them out, and I was answering the same thing over and over again. I decided that, gee, if I wrote one letter, I could answer a thousand letters. Well, that's not quite where I started, but that one over there is, we used to be bulletin number 10. That was the Hemi. We, you know, each year we updated them. I'd add new information, new cylinder heads, new cams, whatever came along. I'd add it, make a new revision. At one point in time, I think we were up to 30 or 40 of these silly things. Poor Miss Kathy had to keep these up to date. SRAM decided that, gee, that's a lot of work. Why don't we put them in a book? Oops, wrong one. Come on. Uh, oops. You'll notice that this is the books that Mr. Schramm came up with. There were three of the blue one on the right, I mean on the left. There was a yellow one, a white one, and a blue one. Then those led, they're about phone book size, almost two inches thick. Uh, and then this one was the next update. <laughs> um, and it keeps getting bigger. It got so big I had to split it into engine and chassis. And then after that I had to split out engines. because It just kept getting so big. And I think I missed one back here. Oops. This is the, my drag seminar decals, uh, obviously the 12th and the 14th or whatever. The seminar was actually started by Mr. Hoover in about 1964 or 5. I'm, I'm guessing that maybe Herb went to one. Oh, yeah. um, and in those days, Mr. Hoover would invite people, to, the, the racers, to come to Chrysler or actually Centerline, which is where I ended up working. Um, it, come and, and we will try to uh, give you information for free, basically. Um, I think that was a mistake. I think we should have charged. <laughs> but anyway, um, the, we would have a hall that was not quite as big as this one. And in some cases, we get 100 or 200 racers. I always remembered we had a, a guy that sat right in the front row right over there because it was a, an auditorium like this rather than the setup here. So the, the seats were all online. And there was a gentleman that sat right over there and he had an afro that set out to here, and I believe it was red. Yeah, thank you, Al Kirschenbaum. I was going to say, it sounded like Kirschenbaum. It was Al Kirschenbaum. And he came to everyone, and he listened to every word Mr. Hoover would say, even though Mr. Hoover would, would kind of go on and on about oil pans. Uh, I won't do that, I promise. <laughs> anyway. Okay, this is actually Dave Bortman. He's a super stock racer for the Rod Shop. Have we all heard of him? 
I put this in there because we used to support races, okay, which, okay, we, we supported races a few years later as Mopar Performance. You'll notice one somewhat unique aspect. On that car, on the side at least, there is not one single thing that says direct connection, and yet we supported them, except the license plate. Okay? Now, th there's a difference. When we go become Mopar Performance, all of a sudden the sides of the cars have Mopar Performance on them. Okay? But we didn't do that in, this, in the 70s and early 80s when we were direct connection. Um, so when this is somewhere in the early 70s, I, no, well, when it was 71, 72, probably mid-70s. Um, that was like Dave because he used 383. <coughs> anyway, moving right along. <coughs> we used to go to the SEMA show. We started in 1980. Uh, that was the year we got Mr. Ayakoka as the um, host of the show, or the main keynote speaker, I believe, is what they used to call him. And that, I mean, this is the president of our company, and I'm, 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 I'm you know, what, I'm nobody. John Crawford actually did all the work for this. John was wound up tighter than an eight-day clock <clears throat> until the speech was over. He was party time. <laughs> but uh, ever since then, we went, to, and we went as DC, Direct Connection, and we displayed. In a, in a few minutes, we'll see some of the pictures from the show. Um, oh, there, oh, oops, sorry, back up. There we are. <coughs> oh, there's me over here, that's terrible. There's Mr. Schramm in the middle, and, and Mr. Larry Henry there, and the, this, this is kind of typical of one of our little booths that we would probably be at SEMA. But we, there were a couple other shows that we went to, and I'm not good enough to tell you which is which. Uh, here we are. <laughs> The gentleman on the far right is Mr. Crawford, and you notice he is smiling. <laughs> uh, wow. Stephanie, uh, left, I'm sorry, I got myself backwards. Uh, Stephanie is next, Mr. Schramm in the middle, uh, the brown suit, I don't know who he is. Way on the right, Mr. Henry, you notice it's a 2.2 sitting in the middle. So this was uh, uh, quite, a, quite an event. Listening to Mr. Iacocca speak is quite, a, quite something. Uh, we also supported a lot of car clubs. And apparently this, this few here tonight, I noticed on the back of the, of the uh, uh, thing we got, uh, the sponsors for the event, there were three or four car clubs. Uh, I think we kept track of them at one point. We had something like 40. Well, the person that actually gets all the credit for working with those people is Kathy Liberta. If they needed catalogs, decals, whatever, she took care of it. They might call me or they might call Larry Henry or even Danny. Uh, so the call would come in to somebody else, but she actually did all the work. <clears throat> and I put down prices at Carlisle. I don't know if back in the 70s they were doing prices at Carlisle, but you get the idea. <laughs> we did decals. We did every shape of decals, great big ones, little tiny ones, tall ones, short ones, fat ones. <clears throat> and Miss Kathy did most of the decals. Now this particular flyer, and if I haven't missed my guess, Larry Henry spent quite some period of time finding all of these uh, emblems. He, what he did is he took all the parts books and he took, went through all of the emblems and looked them up on the, on, we had access to the Chrysler computer and found the ones that were still available and we, we made this flyer to push all that. It was a tremendous amount of work, but it was surprising how many of them were still available, although this was probably done in the, in the early 80s. Oh my heavens, what did, how did that do that? These are, the, the, these are not the first two, what I'm trying to display are the first two t-shirts, not the girls. <clears throat> the one on the left it is the flames and whatever, that was a, I think the very first Dark Connection shirt we did. This is the W2 head uh, that we did, which was the second one. Um, my t-shirt uh, expert, uh, test analysis or whatever, didn't like the second one, uh, so we, we continued that, and you can guess who got to do the t-shirts. Kathy. We went into the performance news business, which, <coughs> excuse me, really wasn't a, it was basically a little newspaper, and we, it was mainly directed at our performance dealers and our WDs. They all got this for free. Uh, the fact that this says what it does is not upon it. 
except <laughs> for whatever reason. I, I did not plan this. I, I am, I'm not, I'm innocent. If, you, if the guys that have really, or girls, that have really good eyesight in the lower left, you'll notice there's a, there's a Dodge Charger. The guy that is behind it is some drag racer named Paul Rossi, and he's road racing, and he won. <laughs> uh, great story. Anyway, I know. That's why I said it. <laughs> um, these are some of our ladies. Uh, missed direct connections in those days. Um, and these are all, the first one over here is Stephanie. She was a California girl. All the rest of them were from Detroit or from at least the Midwest, uh, but Michigan in most cases. Um, and Kathy got to coordinate them. <laughs> um, this, during the period of time that, that we were there, Mr. Maxwell was running an off-road program uh, which had two main aspects. Rod Hall did the, the four-wheel drive trucks, and Walker Evans did the two-wheel drive trucks. Uh, and in most cases, Rod Hall was so fast, he'd win overall. Uh, Rod was typically a, uh, he'd win the four-wheel drive side, and typically the four-wheel drive trucks went as fast as, as the uh, two-wheel drive trucks. Um, nice program. Rumor has it there's one of these here, I, don't, I haven't seen it, um, but we made a, a duplicate of these things. I think we made about 25 of them. Um, oh, my heavens, here we go. Larry Henry and that dude in the blue suit. He should go somewhere. Um, anyway, this That's is... Seema also. That's was it Seema? Yeah. Um, so, that, you know, that we, we would take the, the model to, to Seema. They'd, she'd sign posters and give them away. <laughs> I'm not sure what we're doing here. Here we go. That's Larry Henry and a tip, one of our typical... Booths at a, at, a, uh, at a smaller show. That was the Street Rod Nationals. Remember? Street Rod Nationals. Oh, yeah, small show. 13,000 cars or something. About. <laughs> okay, the gentleman on the right is Charlie Henry. The gentleman on the left is Larry Henry. No relation. <laughs> okay, the guy in the middle, we don't know. The guy on the left is Bill Sosh. The handsome young man on the right is Danny Lewandowski. And we are, are we at the U.S. Nationals? No, that I believe was at Milan. There was a, a Mopar event going on, and uh, that was our first uh, fifth wheel trailer. Trailer. And we told the crew cab, John Greer did that. Okay, what, what, I don't know if you, anybody could hear what Larry said, but <clears throat> when we started going to the races, we, we didn't really have a road show like we did when we got, became Mopar Performance. Uh, we would bring a trailer behind an 18 or fifth wheel behind a trailer. Well, this was one of the first ones that we did that. There's Larry and his lovely wife, Glenda. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I, yeah, I know this. <laughs> I think Larry's uh, asking uh, you know, something about the weather. <laughs> uh, is a funny car driver. <laughs> hey. Larry actually could probably drive a funny car because you were buddies with Roland. <laughs> Oh, come on. Come on. There we go. Danny and his wife, and I'm not sure about the lady. Rockford or uh, Indy? Rockford. That was the D500 that we Rockford was what I was trying to remember the other day, and I couldn't remember. My memory is so bad. Rockford yeah. used to be a bracket race. I don't remember whether they offered $50,000 or $100,000, and they had something like 1,500 cars, and that is where I met the famous Larry Pontenac. <laughs> where are you sitting, Larry? <laughs> Oh, wow. I don't think we need to explain that, that one. Chelsea Proving Grounds. Chelsea Proving Grounds. Yeah, yeah, sure, right. Uh -huh. Mopar Nats. Uh, oh, wow. That is true. The, the original Mopar Nats was at the Chrysler Proving Grounds. And that was Dan at that event. Oh, oh hello. <laughs> this is what we typically would take. We would try to, to guess at what the racers might use at a racetrack. So we'd take a few, you know, gaskets and cylinder heads and you know, whatever they might, you know, ordinarily have a problem with, rebuilding the engine, tech down, whatever, we always got it wrong. If we took heads, they'd want pistons. If we took pistons, they want gaskets. It wouldn't make any difference. They always outsmarted. Well, they didn't really outsmart you, just luck. So to kind of fill in, we would take some show pieces, T-shirts, all that stuff, and poor Dan, he got to keep track of all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, we started out with <laughs> B-Van, two tables. And uh, I'm not responsible for this. That's me. These are little blurbs that we took out of the performance news. Uh, that one was on me. That one's on Danny. 
That was his pose most of the day, talking on the phone, taking orders. <laughs> so, okay, th I think this is the last one. If you notice, this is the last direct connection catalog on the left. It's 1988. This is the first Mopar Performance Catalog, 1989. Uh, with that, I will conclude my speech, and thank you very much. Good evening. If you like this video, please smash the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this one online, hit the subscribe to Mopar TV button. It's totally free. Also, if you'd like to support the Mopar Hall of Fame and vote for future inductees, go to MoparCollectorsGuide.com and subscribe to the only Mopar magazine that matters. A portion of your subscription will go to help keep Mopar history alive for future generations.